Hello, everybody. My name is Ian Kirk Patty Cake. I'm an author, robot, loin streamer, and today I'm also a masochist because I'm bringing to you A Long Dark Shadow by Alan Walker, and that is the, um, the pedophile interview project that he did recently because I read it. I read it so you don't have to. And we're going to go over the findings and my comments on it, my thoughts on it, my thoughts on the content within it, and the concerns that I have for both the subject matter and the things that Alan and his interviewees have said. But before we get started, just a couple of things. Number one, if you enjoy what I do on this channel, please remember to like, share, and subscribe for more. Number two, if you would like to be featured on this channel and not in the way that Alan is about to be featured, check out a couple of links down in the description below. Number one is Lamai, and that is the monthly event here on the channel where I give you guys a prompt. You write a flash fiction of under 1,000 words that relates to the prompt somehow. And then in the following month, I read the prompts. And then the other way to be featured on the channel is the Fresh Meat feature, which I do almost every Monday. And if you are an indie author with a book out there um, available for public consumption, submit your first chapter here. I will do my best to read it. I am slowly upgrading my gear to hopefully read better and better and uh, to capture the quality of your guys' work. And so then submit it there. I pick the book randomly every time I read it. And then on Mondays, you can usually expect that video unless I was in a weird situation. And um, yeah, that's as far as I'm going to say with that. So uh, the third thing is if you would like to read or roast any of my books, all of them are available at your favorite book retailers or at the library upon request. And even if you don't want to roast my books, please request them at your local libraries. It would help me out a whole ton. So with that said, Let's get into the disaster. <laughs> I don't know what else to call this. Before before I get into the rest of this stuff, I just also wanted to apologize for following up last week's book review with this is the book review. But I've had this in my head for a month now at the time of recording this, and I need to do these videos for both this and Jack of Hearts just to get it out of my head so I can have catharsis and stop thinking about this stuff because these videos when I do the book reviews, allow me to like fully process the information and then just flush it. And I felt so drained from reading these books in the last month in the same freaking month, basically one after the other, that I just need to get it out. So I am looking forward to the conversation about this book, just like I was looking forward to the conversation about Jack of Hearts. And um, also putting this book to rest. So it's no longer in my brain. Okay, let's get into the book specifics. Obviously, I read a lot of things that I'm not going to enjoy for the re <laughs> for for a couple of reasons. Um, in this case, I read Alan Walker's work to hear his arguments from his mouth to better understand the things that he says publicly and what his allies say publicly. Alan Walker, in case you didn't know, is somebody who became infamous a couple of years ago for his... Um, defensive pedophilia that eventually got him booted from a job at a university. Fortunately enough for him, he was picked up by John Hopkins and hired for the child sex abuse division. And uh, considering his reputation, I don't necessarily think having somebody who is pro-pedophilia for child abuse is that great of an idea. Now hear me out on why I believe that Alan Walker is specifically pro pedophilia and um, before we really get into the meat of this book because I know that Jeremy Malcolm is going to see this video these are all just opinions and um, my thoughts and takeaways after reading Alan Walker's book I say that Jeremy Malcolm is going to probably find this because when I was posting just snapshots of thoughts while I was reading the book on Twitter as a literal nobody he showed up on my dash to uh, assume my opinions and my perspectives and my politics, name call me, and try to convert me to pedophilia defense. And when he realized he couldn't manipulate my feelings because I'm a robot, he peaced out. And in case you didn't know, Jeremy Malcolm is the CEO or founder or co-founder of the Prostasia Institute, which is um, another pedophile institute that says it's about protecting children from abuse, but we'll get into what all of that means. And in mentioning Jeremy Malcolm, I also think that it's important to say that in an interview he did with, I think, Out Magazine, but you can double check on his 
YouTube channel because he has it posted. He said that he does not see any moral argument against pedophilia. So that is an important jump off point. If you want to see what this book is about for yourself and um, form your own opinions, I highly recommend you grab a copy wherever you can and read it for yourself. Come back and we can have a discussion. Today, I'm just going to share my thoughts and conclusions that I drew while reading. But first, here's a very brief synopsis because this is a research paper. The synopsis is not going to be as long and as detailed because it's a compilation of um, information and interview materials. So a majority of this video will be my discussion in response to the content of the book. But the first thing that comes up in a long dark shadow is a preface which introduces Alan as a having a PhD in criminal justice and a background in social work. He believes prisons should be closed entirely and pedophiles aren't the problem. Society is the problem. The introduction then expands on what the preface says and briefly introduces what he's going to cover in the next six parts of this book. Part one is called Am I a Monster? Forming an Identity as a Minor Attracted, and this speaks on the different ways pedophiles and minor lusting people identify themselves, making it their identity, and how that label utterly controls their self-perceptions. Also, how they come to the conclusion that they are pedophiles. Part two is called Leading a Double Life, Staying Closeted and Coming Out as a Map, and it details how some of the participants live, the struggles they reported in not being totally honest in their with their families and communities, and in some cases, what happened to them when they did tell the people around them that they were pedophiles. This includes someone who is in a university program to become a teacher being told to exit the program since he was training to be around the kids in his targeted age of attraction. Alan seems to imply that this was unfair, but no, this is actually the smart move of any reasonable person. Part three is called Enduring a Rainstorm, maps strategies for coping with their attractions, which details different avoidant and non-avoidant behaviors that the individuals in the study admitted to doing as part of their coping strategies. Alan claims activism is a coping mechanism, and no, I, I don't think that it is, but okay. And I'm sick of people slurring this political stuff into what's supposed to be a non-political and vice versa. Coping is a personal thing. Psychological and behavioral training and therapy are a personal thing. And so turning something personal into a political is really pissing me off. Part four is called, it's a very strong boundary for me, resilience to sexually offending among maps. And this chapter presents some of the reasons why the subjects avoid offending. And by avoid offending, I mean touching children because they aren't at all avoiding doing harm to children. In the coping chapter, a couple of them admitted to using child pornography or child sexual abuse materials, and some of them even say that they didn't see a moral issue with it because it wasn't like they were personally touching the children. So when this book says non-offending, in this case, it just means that they haven't admitted to touching children against their will themselves. Should be noted that three-fourths of the participants said that they wouldn't touch a child because it's harmful to the child, but constantly throughout this also blur the lines between understanding what harmful to the child means, and it never defines how these people see harmful. And a handful of them only blame society's response to pedophilia as being more harmful to children than the actual child sexual abuse. So there's that. So a good three-fourths of them say that the social stigma stops them from touching children, while one-fourth to one-third of them say the legal ramifications make a difference. It's only funny to mention this because Alan suggests that we shouldn't be shaming people who haven't touched children yet. Only the, the child sex offenders should be shamed. Meanwhile, the majority of people in this study straight up say that it's the social reaction that stops them from crossing that line. So what am I supposed to infer from this when you're trying to help pedophiles gain access to children and make society stop responding to it? Part five is called Their Intention Wasn't to Help Me, Mental Health Problems and Care-Seeking Experiences. This section briefly details the different interactions that pedophiles have had with mental health care, some with help, some some being helped, some being outed to the cops, and some feeling like they're not being trusted. Part six is then called You Are Not a Monster toward a shift in attitude concerning maps. To close out Alan's study, he summarizes his interviews and the intentions behind the paper, the things his interviewers expressed, and gives his conclusion on the opinions about pedophiles, how pedophiles are affected by society, and how he hopes to affect society on behalf of pedophiles. His suggestions for improving society are destigmatize pedophilia so that people stop thinking poorly 
poorly of them. And in order to do that, there must be positive representations of pedophiles in the media. So that is the short synopsis of what is in this study. Again, it is only about 150 pages or so. And since it's technically a research paper, there's not a lot to go into in the layout of the book. It's mostly made up of the author's presentations of his point of view and then bringing in references to his interviewees to speak on the subjects that he's presented. The interviews are sporadic and they don't really have reference for who is commenting on what at most times. You get names, sure, but it'll be up to you to figure out how many times that certain person is referenced in this book, if they're referenced evenly, and what age of attraction or range that that person is talking about. If that is somebody that says they were not for criminality, uh, if that person said that there was no moral issue with having an attraction to children, if they said that there was, like, it's up to you to keep all of this information straight and to track it, and I just didn't do that because I just wanted to get through this book. So, with that being said, I'm going to talk about the structural organization of this paper first because... <laughs> It kind of feels like a mess and it, that feels like it's by design. So, and I know it's kind of bizarre to focus specifically on structural organization considering the content of the work. However, since this is a research paper or thesis, I think that the structure of its arguments are kind of important to bring up. For me, this book needlessly obfuscated its interviewees for answering the questions it had. You've got a total of 42 different people listed at the end of this and whom the book mentions including in the interviews. However, you never get to know any of them specifically in relation to the things that they're talking about. You get reference to on the topic of child pornography. Jacob said he consumed but never participated in the making of and didn't see a problem with consuming CP. That's a made-up name just in case anybody tries to call me on that. I just didn't write down the names. In a previous chapter, the page Paper may or may not have told you the occupation of that person and if they were being involved in a career that had to do with children or if they were told to leave or if they were married or if they were widowed again it was up to you to keep this information straight i think for the sake of humanizing any of these people and feeling less like the author was being obtuse it would have been better to structure each section with the introductions of the person and walk through the specific elements of alan's concerns and arguments putting all the information out there at once for each of the interviewees in order for the reader to gain insight into the various individuals participating in this study and how they stacked up to one another. Maybe that's why the book was done the way it was though, with everything thrown around so that you would look at the pedophiles as a group and the really bad ones were mixed in with the ones that hated themselves for it and, were, and you were supposed to put all of your sympathy for the group or the amalgamation instead of recognizing that there were varying shades of gray of help this one, that one's a monster waiting for it to be legalized. I believe from the structure of this book and the way that Alan went at in the beginning, he's not only sympathetic to pedophiles, but actively an advocate for them. And I mean, obviously, at the end of the day, he requested positive representation for pedophiles in media. That means like make a Disney character who's a pedophile. And how would you show that? By putting somebody in a relationship with a child on screen, which is non-consent by default. There is no way that a child can consent. So how exactly do you do this? He also redefined pedophilia from the beginning of the paper to move it from fetish or paraphilia into sexuality territory because of course pedophilia will fit into sexuality if you redefine the word. Alan could have either introduced each individual interviewee in totality and then summarized the variations of opinions and experiences in the end or he could have introduced them briefly and then went from one to the next so the reader for each of these separate occasions so that the reader could get to know them and separate them out from each other rather than think of them as one. One individual group. There were many concerning things stated throughout by the pedophiles and Alan Walker himself that would make you go, why are you advocating for this? And because this isn't science, this is pedophile activism pretending to be sociology, psychology, and victim advocating. Yes, in this case, the pedophiles are the victims of society and so are the children. They are not, in, in the way that this book frames it, they are not victims of pedophiles, they are victims of society judging them for being in a relationship with adults. So, We'll get into those claims here in a second. I want to mention first that the way Alan presents the study isn't unbiased either. Though, if you look at most introductory papers for psychology, sociology, and science, they'll all tell you that people investigate the things that they care about. However, the framing given to this by Alan isn't about keeping it neutral to keep his interviewees comfortable. This is advocacy on the behalf of pedophiles to have their child and sometimes infant attractions normalized. As it is, it's a messy attempt to create a class of victims 
victims out of the pedophiles by mixing the words of the really vile ones with the ones who didn't want their attraction in the first case, while Alan himself says that it's wrong for any pedophiles to seek to suppress or remove the attraction to children because now it's conversion therapy. The first thing that I want to mention in this book is from the start, Alan admits that you cannot change pedophiles, so stop trying. That is what the thesis of this book is. He redefines sexual orientation as, quote, attractions to a certain group that develops early, remains relatively consistent across the lifetime, and is important to the identity of the individual, end quote. Outside of this book, I have never heard of sexual orientation being referred to in that way, but I'm also not going to say that no one else defines it like that because obviously at least two people embrace this because he referenced another person in the book while redefining sexuality. However, common understandings of sexuality in real life are not thought of this way as far as I'm aware. I have to say that Alan also feels unconfident in winning people over to his side because he has to clarify what a pedophile is multiple times. Now, I get that that it's from an academic paper standpoint, and so you want the viewer to know what your terminologies are. However, I gotta say that as a layman, when you start saying that actually not all minor attracted people are pedophiles, that's just a certain group for prepubescent, and there's a different name for if they are infants, and there's a different name for if they're going through puberty, and there's a different name for if they're post-puberty but under 18. You've lost it already because you're you're overcomplicating what people already see as a moral issue by just, again, picking new words to redefine terms. Ellen also states constantly that a pedophile and a child molester are not the same thing, which is fine because yes, the term pedophile literally does refer to the attraction to minors and a child molester is an action. However, if you're going to emphasize how a child molester and a pedophile are not the same thing, and are not on the same level of risk to society, then it doesn't really help to keep saying this and then have your own interviewees identify with child molesters every time they come up in the narrative. In this book, on more than one occasion, interviewees told about experiences they had listening to their coworkers joke about or trash talk um, child molesters that were being put on TV. In one case, it was when the news was playing the arrest of a child molester and the interviewee said that it felt like their co-workers were talking about them. If you can't separate yourself from a child molester population, if you identify with it and don't want them trash talked because it feels like you're being talked about, I'm sorry, but I don't think you're harmless because you're not identifying with the regular people around you and going, oh, that person crossed the line and touched a child when they shouldn't. It's just they're you, but they got found out. If you want society at large to believe that you're safe to be around children, that no harm will come from you, and that you are non-offending and will always be non-offending because you know that the damage, because you know of the damage that it will do to your victim and the power differential between a child and adult, then you don't need to feel bad when child molesters are being arrested. Everyone in this book brags about being non-offending, but a number of them express feeling bad and personally affected by a known offender being nabbed by the police. Because of the structure in this book, we had no idea how many of them felt this sentiment. So in saying all of that, Alan states in the beginning of the book that pedophiles are not beyond help, however, their attraction to children is unchangeable. So the solution is to make society accept pedophiles as in any sexuality and pretend that everything is permissible so long as all of it is sexuality and then society is the one that has the bias. Since I'm mentioning that, I'm going to say sexual orientation versus paraphilia because this gets messed up every time pedophilia is brought into the conversation. I have seen it in the creative writing industry as well when people are writing books that feature a pedophile. Sexual orientation and paraphilias are both part of sexual expression, but they are not the same thing. Sexual orientation specifically refers to the biological sex a person is attracted to in relation to their own, the body parts, primary and secondary sexual characteristics. A paraphilia is the experience of intense sexual arousal to atypical objects, situations, fantasies, behaviors, and individuals. Attraction to minors or children falls into that second category. To call pedophilia a sexuality or sexual orientation would mean that you have to call voyeurism a sexual orientation, exhibitionism, masochism, sadism, necrophilia, bestiality, and every other one of the 500 different types of paraphilias currently documented, plus all of the other ones that exist that are not documented yet. Individuals of any sexuality can develop paraphilias because they are not specifically related to the biological sex that you are attracted to, but to your sexual expressions and experiences. 
classes. Alan and every other person calling pedophilia sexuality is either being subversive and dishonest or is uneducated in what they are talking about. Considering that Alan has a PhD and specializes in this specifically, the way that he conducts himself in his research and the long-term advocacy that he has for pedophiles, including running in many organizations like Before You Act and the Prostasia Institute, I would not call his misclassification of pedophilia ignorance. It's malicious to enable harm to come to children. Is it for his own benefit? I don't really know. Maybe. Maybe not for personal attraction. Maybe for research projects. Maybe for the merit and accolades of calling himself a victim advocate and civil rights leader. I couldn't tell you what his motives are because I can't read minds. Just that based on what I have read in his research alone, he's a pedophile activist and he knows what he's doing when he calls it a sexuality. He's redefined the word specifically so that he could blur the lines into the category throughout the entire book and also in the future of his career. Which leads me into the obfuscation through words because that's a big thing with a lot of this stuff. I already mentioned how Alan makes his books a mess in order to obfuscate the opinions and dangerousness of any of his subjects. He also does it by changing the definition of words and then uses those words continuously. Like I said, one of those words is sexuality and sexual orientation. After redefining sexual orientation so that he can fit pedophilia into it, he describes any counseling to change it as immoral conversion therapy, which shows there is an agenda here. He is pro-pedophilia, and all of his studies are pro-pedophilia activism. Another word he uses is attraction. However, the instances he uses that in all equal lust, because it's not about having a relationship with children. There is no adult having a relationship with a two-year-old or a five-year-old or a ten-year-old. They are not mentally mature enough to give any adult the emotional and romantic comfort that they might claim they want from that individual. So what really is attraction in this context? context, it's the desire for any of these adults to fuck a minor. One of the interviewees in this book references the Bible and saying, the Bible says that if you've had attraction towards someone, it's the same as having sex with them. This is a notable quote because what the Bible actually says is if you've lusted for someone, then you have committed that sin. The fact that this person conflates attraction and lust tells you that he is not attracted to children and is using so many words to conflate what it is that he is actually saying. The use of attraction in this case is an attempt to make the phrasing more palatable to the layman, which is why I'm saying it outright. Otherwise, please, in the comments, inform me what kind of emotional and romantically fulfilling relationship can an adult have with a five-year-old? You say it's not just about sex but tell me, have you talked to a five-year-old? Have you talked to a 13-year-old? What kind of maturity or long-lasting relationship do you think you are suggesting when you all outright say that you'll dump them when they outgrow their lusty age category that you are interested in? Some, one of them said that they were even specifically just interested in twinks. So how can you tell me that this is a sexuality, what is clearly a type? Alan talks about the torment a pedophile is doomed to feel in their life to try to get your sympathy because they can't seek the relationship or sex with the target of their lust. I've already said this, but for the dude in the back, you're not going to get emotional fulfillment from a child. And what this study also lacks is the counterbalance saying what a child cannot mentally or emotionally do for these adults. What is the source of these attractions, the power dynamics at play, anything? Because Alan cannot honestly study pedophilia or else it would show how deranged it is and there is no justification for saying that it's fine, as Alan does in this book. Your adult desire to be with a child so that you can rub your rocks off and ruin someone else's life is not a civil rights issue. It's not about forming a deep, meaningful relationship and the interviewees in this book say as much when at least one of them admits, I'm dating this guy who is at the borderline Line of what I'm attracted to age-wise, and I'm bummed that I'm going to have to break up with him in a year or so when he's no longer in that age group. This isn't about love or anyone in this book claiming that it is. It's lying to your face for their sexual paraphilias so that they can use humans like sex toys, and that's the kind of thing that makes the depictions in Jack of Hearts even more disgusting. That book openly advocates for the dehumanization of other people and seeing them as nothing more than a dildo or a fleshlight. Who cares about the emotional damage done? Who cares about throwing humans away? They're just like a shoe, right? In case you didn't know, I just did a, a book review for Jack of Hearts. It is a YA book. It is a book that is being voted out of a bunch of middle schools and possibly high schools right now and pr possibly throwing um, 
drama inside of libraries. So go and check that out if you want more information on it. You listen to these people and their justifications they make for dehumanizing others and they think that it's okay and they think that you are the problem with society, which takes me to my next point. Alan Walker and company blame society for all of the damage. So part four of this book is called It's a Very Strong Boundary for Me, Resilience to Sexually Offending Among Maps, where it outlines the reasons that hold the pedophiles back from molesting children. Throughout the book, Alan and his interviewees say there is nothing morally, ethically, or psychologically wrong with having a child in relationship with an adult. According to Alan, three-fourths of of his participants said that they didn't want to harm a child. However, while he spent time explaining what sexuality meant in his, the context of his book, he never described what harm meant. And then when you listen to the interviewees, they constantly reference harming children as means of society as the biggest harm to children in the case of adult children relationships because of the backlash, because society can't handle it, because society will judge a child for being in a relationship with an adult. And so it's socially and emotionally damaging because of society and not because of the adult taking advantage of and raping that child. That is the argument that the book makes. With consideration how this book was made, either Alan specifically crafted the bits of interviews that he shared or the interviewees kept it vague, but all that's mentioned as direct quotes on harming children is this nebulous, I don't want to harm them and society isn't ready for it. Society would mistreat the child being in a relationship with an adult. Never do the interviewees or Alan present statistical information about child sexual abuse victims and survivors. Never do any of them mention the physical, emotional, or psychological damage that is known to come from being abused sexually as children. Now, not only that, but none of them acknowledge the predatory nature that's just preying on minors. They try to claim that pedophilia isn't automatically predatory, but it is. From a developmental standpoint, the adults will always have the long-term advantage. Also, something that constantly gets lost in this conversation from the point of view of the pedophiles is that they claim that they have no control or less control over themselves than the children have in the situation. And I've seen this perspective in books like Heather by G.C. Mackay, and while it makes plenty of sense that a predator might frame himself to be the victim for sympathy points and because their own head is messed up, any reasonable person who does not have a vested interest in the outcome of being let adults fuck children would realize and state that an adult is held to a higher sense of responsibility than a child. An adult has a responsibility to restrain themselves, to show self-control, and to act appropriately around those younger and in sketchy situations. It is an emotionally and psychologically broken or twisted adult that says that they have less authority and autonomy over themselves than a child, in which case, why are you allowing somebody like this to try to determine policy and how society should be run? Additionally, Alan and his interviewees never recognize that children can be coerced and manipulated via obvious naivety, positions of power and trust, and that this would be considered predatory behavior and still rape. They only recognize legitimate legitimately forcing yourself on someone, on a child, when they say no and force has to be used. Moving on from the nebulous sense of harm, Allen said that at least one third of his interviewees only didn't molest children because they feared legal consequences. When the two biggest reasons pedophiles don't go after children are both societal reasons, then his advocacy for normalizing pedophilia has a clearly stated result, enabling pedophiles to molest children without consequence. Based on what's stated in this book by the author and his interviewees, I honestly don't know how else I'm supposed to take any of this book. He tells pedophiles not to change. He tells society that pedophiles can't change. They're born this way. He tells society that it's immoral to tell pedophiles to restrain themselves and to work on their issues, and he shares that the major opinion of all of his interviewees is that society's opinion is holding pedophiles files back and is abusive to them and to children. When the conclusion Alan draws is destigmatize pedophilia, what else am I supposed to call this but openly advocating for pedophilia and child molestation? Finally, Alan says that pedophilia is unchangeable because it's a sexuality. He argues that sexuality is inborn, which is why it's immoral to try to change it with pedophiles. However, he also clarifies later in this book that the attraction to children often centers around two types of occurrences. An individual experienced some form of 
adverse event in childhood or they want to go back to childhood in some way. Many of the participants in the study even admitted that their interest in children is related to societal ineptitude and intimidation by adults and a desire to escape the responsibilities and hardship of adulthood. If that is the case, then this isn't inborn. This is a social and developmental maladjustment. It's learned behavior, dysfunctional, and it can be fixed. You're not helping anyone by encouraging people not only to maintain damaging behavior, but then by encouraging damaging behavior to be embraced and forced upon others. So this section is called, Isn't It Funny? Because these were some observations and some things that came out of the book that I didn't know where else to put them. Number one, two specific organizations were brought up that work as pedophile resources. One of them is called Before You Act, and the other is called The Virtuous Pedophile. No, that is not satire. The virtuous pedophile is an offshoot from Before You Act because according to Alan, Before You Act refused to say that child adult relationships were immoral and the virtuous pedophile believed that it was necessary to state the position that it was wrong. Again, tell me what that says about these people. Alan also claims that one of his interviewees expressed having sexual experiences at the age of 12 with another 12 year old that he was in love with and this formed his attraction to the age group that he has held onto into his older years. He considered his attraction at that same age with people of his same age to be pedophilia. He pulled it as an identity and took it with him as he grew up. Attraction to people your age is not pedophilia. And how is this 12 year old aware, was this 12 year old aware? It felt like some retconning was going on with some of these people. Um, but this is a danger in making your sexual interest your entire identity. Not only this, but this author also attempted to equate hobbies and interests to specific age groups so that if you're 30 and you like Legos, well, Legos are for children. So mentally you might be eight years old because you enjoy playing with Legos. So this means that you're probably justified in being attracted to eight year olds, right? That logic is literally used in this book. So no, it's trash logic, and I can't even believe that Alan not only has a PhD, but works for John Hopkins. Like, what is this garbage trash? And the next thing that comes through in this book is that pedophiles are using subversive tactics. Back when I was reading the book, I posted a bit about it on Twitter. Jeremy Malcolm, the founder or co-founder of the Prostasia Institute or organization, uh, came at me. Without knowing anything about me or my position, he brought up the boogeyman of conservatives saying that LGBTQ plus and pedophiles are the same. I have never once said that. And in fact, I responded by saying that I thought it was dangerous for the LGBT community that pedophiles were trying to attach themselves. And Jeremy Malcolm kept linking the two, saying that it was a boogeyman by the far-right conspiracy theorists, yet you go to his website and he personally links pedophiles to the LGBTQ plus community. Not only that, but the pedophiles in this book link themselves to that outright by stating that they consider queer an accurate description of their pedophilic identities and that they are going to keep using the label so that they can be true to who they are as well as fitting into this community without the backlash because they don't have to actually tell people that they're pedophiles. They can consider queer to be accurate to pedophilia. So outright pedophiles are stating that they misappropriate labels to subvert and blend into communities that don't want them. And Jeremy knows this. One of his business partners interviewed people who said this. But he'll jump on you and call you a far right conspiracy theorist if you mention it. Another label that the pedophiles try to subvert, and I thought y'all might want to know this, is pro-choice. That is, the pedophiles in this book stated that some of them call themselves pro-choice, meaning that they are pro-children choosing if they want to be in a relationship with adults. So again, using existing language to slip into communities and build support for something that is completely different and you'll never know because they're using phrases that you are already comfortable with. Next is this book discourages pedophiles from seeking help. Because Alan is or was a social worker, he believes in affirmation therapy. This book openly advocates and encourages that pedophiles not seek therapy of any kind unless it's to tell them to embrace their pedophilic interests because anything else is immoral conversion therapy. Additionally, it encourages embracing your pedophilia as a legitimate coping strategy. Draw your own conclusions about what's going on here. Pedophile representation. Alan Walker and the pedophiles in this book complain about the lack of positive representation of pedophiles in media. They mention the only time that they hear about pedophiles is when someone's being arrested for molesting a child. But tell me, dude, when would you hear about pedophiles when the entire identity revolves around sexually molesting children? In chapter three, as Alan's outlining society's depiction and dislike of pedophiles, he shallowly states, researchers found that people feel more fear and anger towards pedophiles than other groups frequently thought of as 
as objectionable, such as individuals who abuse alcohol, people with antisocial tendencies, and sexual sadists. Idiotically, Allen doesn't go into why this statement exists the way that it does. You'd think it might be important to understanding and presentation to the audience as for why he might believe stigma against pedophiles is wrong. However, Alan knows what the difference is between all of these different groups, so all he can say is, look, people dislike the pedophiles. They also dislike these other people over here. That's just society. They're basically the same thing, victims of social stigma. Alan makes vague claims of opposition to pedophile, but never presents earnestly the responses of the public, the fears of the public, to juxtapose the hatred against pedophiles with your empathy, then resulting to this weak comparison of pedophile hate to stigmas faced by the LGBT and mental illness sufferers. If that's the case, then stop pretending the two are different, you lying piece of trash. Yes, this legitimately makes me mad. It's people lying to everyone's faces in public to try to get you to say that child abuse is fine, to normalize child abuse, for getting your rocks off. It's playing on the empathy that society naturally has in any good person's willingness to trust an expert in the field, and oh my gosh, is it disgusting. The fact that these people are getting more and more bold and dare to say that anyone telling them that fucking children is immoral and wrong shows how unthreatened and disturbed they've become. You don't get to hurt people and destroy children's futures just to get your rocks off, you sick bastards. Bill this call for representation, again, as more subversive tactics on many of the pedophiles saying, I thought that I was the only one like this until I saw someone else that, that said that they were interested in kids and I need to see that more. No, you don't. And there's no way that you thought that you were the only person who was interested in children. This is a tactic for empathy manipulation, again, using the representation call because it is already so familiar and so supported by so many, it is a familiar phrase. Occupational hazards. Just wanted to bring it up really quick that many of these non-offending braggers constantly put themselves in situations where they would be around the temptations that they have a hard time controlling themselves around. And according to them, it would be unfair if you told them not to pursue that line of work or to not volunteer in that area. At least one interviewee mentioned that he was in school to become a teacher for his age of lust group, and at least one or two of them said that they volunteered as scouts or church situation um, babysitters around children for children of their attraction groups. If you want to teach or volunteer, there are many, many ways to do so that don't put you out as a potential risk. You say that you're not a threat, yet you keep putting yourselves consistently in a predatory situation of trust, preparing for offending and getting away with it. Do you know how many teachers abuse children in school? Do you know that the crime that somebody is caught for is usually not their first crime? By saying that you're not a risk and being offended when people tell you not to pursue a job that puts you in a trusted position of authority over the object of your affection, you don't help yourself look like not a predator. So I already sort of mentioned this before, but they claim that therapy is worthless. When therapy is brought up, many of the interviewees assert, with Alan's agreement, that therapy is useless unless it's affirmation, because going to therapy didn't help them eliminate their sexual interest in children. I don't know how long any of them attended therapy, but behavioral therapy is not easy, nor is it fast. It's a long-term process, and anyone who has dealt with any level of cognitive or emotional issues that requires behavioral therapy knows that it is something that you have to work at consistently, and often, you may not remove the trigger or problem entirely from your life. The best that you can do is learn to the coping methods and how to minimize your personal responses. Yet these people went looking in for magic bullets of silence this thing immediately and when they didn't get it they went oh this is useless guess I'm gonna just stick my dick in society until it accepts my fetish of harming children as normal. This doesn't help you look reasonable and it makes you look pathetic lazy and superficial in your but I tried. Mm. Again long-term behavioral change takes consistent effort and it's not easy. What non-offending really means. So Alan Walker claims that all 42 people in his study are non-offending pedophiles, and by that all he can promise is that they have told him that they haven't touched a child against their will. Considering the implications and descriptions given in the study, it says nothing for coercion or lying to Alan in order to get into the study, or even lying on Alan's part in order to have more people for the study. However, at least a handful of them admit to having consumed legitimate child pornography as a coping mechanism. 
Some of them admit to being ashamed to have used it, while others say they see nothing wrong with using it or nothing immoral about creating it. According to a Sam Harris podcast that I recently listened to, where he interviewed Gabriel Dance, a specialist in sex crimes against children, back in 2007, there were fewer than 100,000 individual instances of child sexual abuse materials reported using online algorithm methods. In 2019, it was over 17 million. Gabriel Dance also stated that just seeing child sexual abuse materials in any way online is the only thing required in American law that you immediately report it because if you don't, it is a crime. So the fact that any of these participants were consumers of child sexual abuse materials meant that they were in fact offending pedophiles, not they, they just weren't convicted. This alone deflates the entire argument that they are harmless to society, bro. No, they're not. And y'all are propagating the abuse of children when you say that it's fine that they consume child pornography. So this is something that keeps coming up. It's the obsession with talking about sex. I don't know why it keeps coming up. It came up in Jack of Hearts. It was in C.L. Carhart's books. And I'm sure that there's going to be much more of it in the stuff that I read in the future. Because I don't know why. But all that's standing out to me with this book and with these other books is exhibitionism. And those that need to have their sexual preferences... Um, put out in front of others to be seen. I've noticed an uptick in people who cannot just live and do their thing on their own, but they need to tell others about their sexual interests and they need you to opine on it, specifically in affirming and positive ways, and maybe obsess about it with them. And Jack of Hearts, Jack was disappointed when he told his mother that he was gay and she just said, all right, son, here are some condoms, be safe. He wanted her to make a deal about it, good or bad. He just wanted something. This book has a number of people who feel like they need to tell their children that they had fantasies about fucking children. They needed to tell their partners when they were married. They needed to tell their families what their jack-off material was. In at least one case, Alan treats saying anything short of enthusiastically praising that's so good for you, let's talk about it, as if it's oppressive, bigoted, and somehow not supportive. This book tries to pretend that obsessively talking about your sex life with everyone, specifically your family, is normal, but I can tell you I haven't ever obsessively heard about the private sex lives of others, and I don't want to know for anyone. But legitimately, this book says, Quote, after my participants disclosed, they recalled the conversations wouldn't come up again even after the initial comforting responses. End quote. But who is genuinely going around telling the entire world what their sexual interests are and constantly expecting the world to revolve around their sex lives? There was legitimately a section in this book that reads the person's family accepts them for their disclosures. They don't like that this person fantasizes about children, but they don't kick them out of the house and they still talk to them. They just don't want to talk about that person's interest in fucking children. And I do not understand how anybody thinks this is normal to be talking to your family constantly about your sexual interests. Again, I go back to Jack of Hearts where I have never read a book more obsessed with sex and I've legitimately read stuff that's marketed as smut, not YA LGBT. I need to take a poll right now in the comments how many of you watching this video consider telling your friends and family and having regular conversations in detail about your sex and sex lives and sexual interests interests and your sexual interests and your sexual fantasies how many how for how many of you is that normal i even remember in arcane gateway by cl carhart swanee's sitting down with her dad at breakfast after she's gotten back from a long concert weekend with her friends and they openly discuss how he promised that he wouldn't sleep with her friends even though they constantly talked about wanting to bang him he threw parties where adults would come meet each other and hook up at his house where his 13 year old daughter was and his only protection was stay in your room, don't come out, the parties are for adults. He threw these parties also with a sexually predatory nature that Swanee would deliberately dress in ways to turn off the old men who would hit on her all the time. But it was just normal and dad didn't notice or they, and they still had a good relationship. So maybe I'm just old school, but I've never experienced and I would never consider telling my parents about my sexual life or fantasies. Unless you're writing a smutty fantasy scene of some kind, I cannot see a situation where this is anything short of disturbing. But real life isn't equitable to fantasies.
Haha, <laughs> you may notice that my clothing changed. That's because I had to shoot this on two different days. So, the dubious sainthood of the interviewees. So I mentioned this in my Amber Heard video about a storytelling mistake that she made during her testimony. Often when someone is lying or trying to beef up their persona, the goodness of their persona, or the character that they're trying to play, they will avoid admitting to any amount of human fault that they may be weak to. In the case of this book and Amber Heard, it was never admitting that she could or that they could do any wrong in any of the instances that they were involved in or that she was involved in. So this plays into the interviews with the pedophiles as many of them take the hyperbolic road of I could never hurt a child and push on that really hard. Actually, since we're all human, we all have the ability to harm others. But when you try so hard to say that you can't or you could never have a problem, you can't possibly do anything wrong. You make it more, you make yourself more questionable, like you're trying too hard, especially when it's specifically related to an area of interest that you have a weakness. There are definitely some destructive behaviors that are more or less likely depending on the individual based on their personal affinity. But when your entire identity is tied into your sexual interest in children and your considerations for harm are societal only, I think it's a little too dubious to say that you would never hurt a child. Everything in your head literally revolves around children and child harm that you refuse to recognize, at least if the interviews in this book are anything to go off of. Also a brief aside here is that this book tries to paint the image of everyone thinks pedophiles are these ugly, mean, monstrous old men, but no, it's just us, the normal looking Joe who doesn't look like a monster, tee hee, in order to mess with your perceptions and make you think more casually about pedophiles. Now it is true that pedophiles can look like anything, they can be men or women, they can be monstrous looking or regular looking people or the guy with like the balding head, like all of the, the stereotypes could be true or it could be the opposite of the stereotypes. But there was some level of manipulation tactics going on here. And yes, again, uh, dubious presentation. So with everything that has been said, what are some genuine problem solving things that could be done in this situation with this population? The true fix for this issue is not wrapping your identity around who or what you want to have sex with. Recognize bad, dangerous, and immoral behavior. Agree to change it. Behavioral therapy exists for a reason and it is not easy. It's not a quick pill. It's not an instant fix. So you have to accept that there's going to be work involved. It's going to be uncomfortable and you may never fully be resolved of that issue, but you have to accept substitutions. That's the word that I want. So saying embrace dangerous or bad behaviors that harms others is not helpful or caring. It's self-destructive and destructive to your society, to your peers, to your family and friends, and to the subjects of your lust in the case of children. Affirmation is not therapy. Telling people to stop shaming pedophiles who haven't touched children yet isn't helpful when almost all of them admit that it's the social stigma that stops them from touching kids. Pretending children aren't harmed so that you can get your rocks off is disgusting and someone explained to me how anyone connected to the nastiness of this book is not pro-fucking children. Kind of a weird way to end this review is improvements that could have been made with this book. Create the narrative. Humanize the interviewees by letting the reader get to know them straight, rather than obfuscating and mixing them around and confusing one for the other to make them more of an amalgamation of a blob at a cheap wordplay tricks where you intersperse words of justice and quotes and bias and oppression with pedophilia. Be honest about the harm that pedophilia causes. Show the pros and the cons. Show both sides of what it is that you're trying to, to express. And show both sides of this equation that you're trying to express. That is why are people against pedophiles and who these pedophiles are? As you hide one side very specifically and only make vague references to unfair treatment, you look like you're hiding the truth of the damage done to children because of your sick agenda. And honestly, your agenda's right up in there. Uh, your subject's own words contradict their claims of harmlessness and your goals for society. For this sort of content, you need to take no stance and not tell society to lay off a of pedophile shaming if you want anyone to trust you. With your own stance bias, with your own biased stance inserted into all of the content, you give no reason for anyone to listen to your reasoning on any of this stuff, especially these sensitive type of subjects. This includes hiding statistics on child sexual abuse victims, never describing words that would be harmful to your argument, and never acknowledging the legitimacy of positions that oppose yours. It's lazy writing at best and diabolical manipulation at worst. Very quickly, who is Alan Walker? This is just gonna be a base section and like why I decided I needed to read this book to 
share it with you all. Alan Walker is a social worker with a PhD in criminology who was also apparently surprised that when researching for this book and that when he was taking criminology courses and studying criminology, all of the pedophile information that he ran into was related to criminal offenders. Uh, that was included in the book, and also one of his reasons for why he needed to write this book is because not all pedophiles are criminals, but all of the information he ran into while studying criminology was criminal. So there's that. Alan Walker gives more benefit of the doubt to self-admitted pedophiles than psychologists, and while I don't think psychologists, sociologists, and scientists are completely right all the time, and we should constantly be questioning to keep everything above board, as that is the scientific method, the methodology for social workers, which is advocacy, which is that you just believe what they tell you and you fight for them, is not helpful for, for society when you're dealing with people with these sort of paraphilias that are dangerous to others. What comes across for me here is someone who spent way too much time in prisons and has become more sympathetic to criminal offenders than those who have been harmed by these people and are actually victims or and are the victims that they've created. You get this in the preface of Alan Walker's book where he is more sympathetic to the criminals that he's talking to and he calls them victims, but never acknowledges the victims that those criminal offenders actually created. He says as much, now I say all of this as someone who does believe that we need prison reforms because I don't think our prison systems are set up well and they're not helping pretty much anyone as criminals are made worse while they're spending time in there and many of them in there who want reformation or help have a hard time finding it. It's such a big topic though and I can't go into the minute details about any of it and um, I don't have all of the answers either. It's going to take a discussion and a community to sort of fix the problems that are the freaking criminal justice system. But in saying Alan Walker over empathizes with criminals, I just thought that it was important to note that I don't believe that prison is just there to make people suffer. So don't try to pull that one on me in your arguments if you're going to be in the comments with some arguments. So thank you. Ultimately, I think there are two camps in which this subject should be approached. I feel genuine empathy for individuals who had something bad happen to them to the point that they are sexually dysfunctional, attracted to children, and genuinely feel bad about it and want it to stop. I especially feel bad for them if they go seeking help, and the only help they can find is somebody encouraging them to continue this destructive behavior that harmed them in the first place. If you're working through your issues to become a healthy adult seeking a healthy relationship, I wish you the best, and I don't have anything bad to say about you for trying to work through your problems. I do agree with Alan that individuals who train to assist those with sexual dysfunction and relate weird relationships with their sexual stuff need to be prepared for when a pedophile comes in asking for help. And that being prepared does not mean encouraging them to indulge in the behavior and to encourage them to fantasize. That is not how you help somebody in this situation. There were a couple of instances in this book where the interviewees said they walked into a counseling session, they said what their issue was, and the counselor called the cops on them, or they were not prepared, or they were not given recommendations. And while not every psychologist can give recommendations of who to go to for specific sexual dysfunctions, I do think that psychologists who are trained specifically in sexual dysfunction do need to be prepared if somebody has not yet committed a crime. However, I also find it dubious because it is, like, there's this weird weird spot, obviously, because you are required as a psychologist that if you believe, or a doctor, if you believe somebody is causing harm or imminently to cause harm, you have a requirement to report. And in reading the interviews by these people in here, uh, it leaves a lot to be desired and makes you wonder if they're being dubious, if they lied, if they went into the the um, psychologist's office and admitted to harming children or admitted to having child pornography. And so then that is why the the doctors called the cops on them. Of course, they would never admit it because that is a crime. So there's so much to lose in being completely honest in this situation that I don't know how much you can actually trust the information given through this book. And we also know that at least a couple of them are criminal for having child pornography and Alan likely did not report any of them for having child pornography because he wants to maintain those relationships. So there is that. Now, on the other hand, if you are the subversive piece of trash who puts your entire value in your desire to fuck children and you blame society for the fact that you can't diddle yourself good enough because it would require you to harm and destroy the lives of children, I will show you to the wall. Also, social workers are not therapists. Stop 
donning the title so that you can destroy people from the inside by encouraging destructive behaviors when others come for help because it is so disgusting. I have been victim to this as well, where it was just encouragement when I was distressed and I needed help and you led me wrong and you diagnosed me wrong and I got screwed over for it and it sucks. So stop doing this. Affirmation is not therapy. So those are my thoughts on this Je kind of generally composited because I had a lot of things I had to condense to make it fit into categories. Uh, the book is disturbing. It's a disturbing look at these people, especially if you think of the dubious nature and the things that they are not telling you, which are definitely uh, involved. But I highly recommend you read the study for yourself if you can stomach it and uh, come back and we can talk in the comments either about the content itself, anything I mentioned before, and uh, any other societal issues that you may <laughs> or may not see related to this thing. With that said, thank you so much for watching. Looking forward to your thoughts and the conversations down below. Sorry for the super long and super dark video, but now it is time to move on from this. We will see what my future book reviews hold. Also, oh, if you want me to check out any um, books like this or like Jack of Hearts or there's any other weird or disturbing books that you would like the DL on, um, in the way that I give book reviews and analysis, let me know in the comments down below or email me and I will take a look at <laughs> possibly reading them and presenting what I can't, what, uh, what my findings are. So this is my gift to the community, even though the community never asked for it. Yeah. So with that said, thank you so much for watching. Have a great weekend and don't die. Hello boomers. My name is Yanana Nanana. In case you didn't know, I'm a YouTuber from Nide, a small town in eastern Ukraine. My family has never really understood what I do in the woods, but all I've ever wanted is to make a better life for us all. Papa always comes home from the mines angry, dirty, and tired. It's a necessary evil to do your job and be in a place that you don't want to be. But I've never wanted to spend my life doing exactly what was necessary of me. Yanni? There's someone here to see you. Americans. Americans? Yeah. Good morning. My name is Tom Cruise. This is my partner, Bob Dylan, and we are big fans of your work. You're a couple of boomers. Actually, I'm a Gen Xer, but I digress. We'd like to sponsor you. A sponsor? What does that mean? We'd like to supply you with a couple of things to, uh, help your channel explode. Who is it? Jan Bagan. Good. For a moment, I thought you were one of the Katsap looking for trouble again. What do you mean? They say they're looking for a terrorist. They want to declare war. What point is there to declare war? Human beings are simple creatures. You understand what drives humanity? You understand all human motivation. There's someone out there doing something bigger than your internet videos, and they won't hesitate to use you as a scapegoat. The Russians are begging for a reason to declare us hostile so they can take everything we have. Don't give them that reason, Jan. I should just go home, like Boris said, but I checked the video I posted last night and it has over 500 views. I'm going viral. I don't have a choice. I must produce another video. The jar I'm holding slips out of my sweaty palms. I can't waste any more time and go back for it. I grab my tripod saying, sorry, 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 while I keep moving. The jar explodes. I'm deafened by something so loud and powerful. It seems unreal. Jan, did you see that? Where the hell have you been? You mean the explosion? Yes. That was me. You needed to not do this today. You don't understand, Alex. I had to do it. I had to get the views. You're going to get yourself killed, Jan. No, no, no. They're looking for a terrorist. And how do you look different than a terrorist? I'm not trying to hurt people. Ignorance of war will not stop bullet from straying into your head.